How can I build my meals to provide me with the greatest satiation, keep me from overeating, and keep me satisfied and thinking clearly and sharply whenever I may need to? Hey everybody, so I know I promised a video on all the satiety hormones this week. I am still just diving, diving, diving into the research. It's just getting better and better and I'm just not ready to release it yet. Anyway, keep waiting, but this video is still going to teach you a little bit about satiety hormones and how we we can use them to our advantage when we're trying to plan a diet that's going to help us fast or go for periods of time without eating and still feeling good. I have a lot of experience in my own body and my own genetics and all that kind of stuff with going for 24 hours not eating. I understand that not everybody fasts because they're doing it for health reasons, they may be doing it for spiritual reasons or because they're on a surgical shift and they are not going to be able to eat or drink for long periods of time. They need to put their bodies in a state where they can still perform. In this video, I just want to break down three main strategies that you can utilize to make fasting easier for you. Now, I will have people come up to me, like at school, especially because they know that my background is in nutrition. They'll be like, Laura, I got to fast for this Jewish holiday or whatever, but we have two exams that day. What should I do? I'm going to like not be able to think. And I'm like, I wish that you had gotten to me like a week or two ago because I could really set you up for this. But you need to know right now for tomorrow, this is my advice to you. So you're going to get that advice in this video and understand why I wish that when people ask me for this advice, they were asking for it a week or two or three ahead of time. And then I'm going to go into what I would consider my Ramadan preparedness theory. So I have never done Ramadan. I've watched people do Ramadan. I have, like I said, I have Muslim friends and someone was just telling me in med school, they're super afraid for Ramadan. It's coming up very soon, a couple weeks. It's a whole month where you cannot eat or drink during the day when the sun is up. I've never dry fasted myself, but I have theories based on the things I'm going to talk about today about how one could prepare for Ramadan. And I am considering trying it because I want to be able to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. I want to experience that kind of challenge. I love challenges. That's also something that maybe I'll make a video about someday. I'm really big on these like month long challenges. This video is kind of a good way for me to think through it and how I would if my friend really wanted to know what my advice was to help her be able to get through Ramadan feeling good, getting all the health benefits that she possibly can. So first I'm just going to quickly define what intermittent fasting is for this video. People will define it multiple ways. I'm going to define it as anytime you don't consume any calories via food, drink, etc. Um, unless it's like infinitesimal, like not very many calories, like some people will fast with black coffee, for example. You have to not consume calories for at least 16 to 18 hours. And the reason that I say that is that's around the time that you start getting a lot more of the benefits. There are benefits that can start happening at the four to five hour mark, but it really gets into the swing of things around the 16 to 18 hour mark. Studies have shown that over and over again. And definitely once you've been doing it for two to three days, even more things happen, etc. And a lot of people these days, they have like an OMAD one meal a day sort of routine. That's something that I've been following a lot more recently. It's just simpler and also it seems to work really, really well for fat loss and not losing lean tissue. Okay, satiation strategy. So this is kind of a sneak peek of my satiation video that I promised this week. So going for 16 to 18 hours probably sounds like a lot. And like, if, especially if you've never done it before, it sounds impossible, but believe me, it is, especially if you think about the macros in this way. And this is actually how it was taught to me in my nutritional therapy course as like a really good simplistic way of explaining to people how to balance their meals if they want to feel full and satiated, okay? So think of carbohydrates, which are things like plants and grains, pastas, breads, all processed foods that you'd find in a box, like not whole, you know, from the earth sorts of foods. So those, think of those as twigs, okay? And then think of fat as like a big log. Okay, and then think of protein as another big log. Now, let's say you want to build a fire and this fire is going to be the fire that gives you energy for the entire day. Would you use the most of in building this fire at the beginning of your day? Would you use just a big pile of twigs? Probably not because they're just gonna burn out really fast and you're just gonna have to keep adding and adding and adding and adding. And isn't that what life is like when you're eating a lot of carbs? You eat the carbs and then hmm, hour two, maybe only 30 minutes later, you're 
hungry again and you got to add more twigs to the fire, right? Now carbs, they have their place. They're definitely not required by the human body at all, but they're nice to have, I understand. So using a little bit of it to kind of start your fire, great. But you're going to need the log of protein and you're going to need the log of fat over the top so you have nice long burning energy. So that's a very simplistic way of putting it. But it's actually completely true. So if you organize your meals in such a way that you have those things, then you're actually going to be more satiated. And the sciencey reasons behind this, I'm definitely going to go into more in that satiation video that I talked about. But just to give you a tiny taste, proteins, especially meals in high protein, there are a lot of studies to show this, they are going to increase your satiety and lower your portion size. And that's because they trigger hormones like GLP-1, CCK, PPY, and even like modest insulin. Like, a, like insulin will be triggered by proteins and even fats will trigger insulin to some extent. And that's because insulin's a good thing. It has good properties. It will help you feel satiated, okay? Now, protein is very good at triggering these. And these go and they talk to all sorts of parts in your body, but especially your brain to let you know, hey, we got food, we're good. You don't need to keep eating. In fact, let's slow down digestion a little bit so it goes slowly and that's one of the benefits of fat fat in your diet will actually trigger CCK and uh, PPY even more than protein especially PPY or sorry it's sorry it's PYY I'm pretty sure yeah yeah, it's PYY. So fats will trigger PYY even more, like the most. And that is a very powerful satiety signal and very powerful slow down the digestion signal, which means that the food is not going to just go through you super fast and get um, absorbed super fast. It's going to slow down, which will allow that meal to feed you and keep your energy stable for even longer. So please make your meals high in protein. We're not saying like super high, just make good animal protein. It's the best quality, most bioavailable nutrient dense protein is animal protein. Same with animal fats. They're just packaged together for a reason, people. This is, this is what we ate as we evolved. This is what our bodies know how to get nutrients from. So put your meal around that. And if you must have some plants, which I have plants sometimes, I have a little bit of plants almost every day, but that's because I figured out which ones work for me. So you add that as your little kindling and then you've got your nice big meal, okay? There's something else I wanna say about the carbohydrates and that is that they they can trigger some satiety signals. GLP-1 is triggered by carbohydrate and that is a satiety signal as long as you are not insensitive to that signal, but they don't trigger some of the most powerful in the moment, in the meal satiety signals. So if you eat a ton of carbs, you're not going to get a lot of satiety from them, especially if they are processed carbs, because those do not trigger satiety, okay? They're also notoriously addictive. So some of the biggest substances in carbohydrates would be sugar, which is known and has been shown to be more addictive than heroin. And then we've got gluten, which I'm sorry, does cause intestinal permeability in every single person on earth that has been demonstrated as well. And that's just terrible for all sorts of reasons, but maybe we'll talk about that some other day. But gluten and sugar are both incredibly addictive. They attach to opioid-like receptors in your brain, making you want more, making you crave them. So the more that you eat them, the harder it is to stop, the harder it is to not crave them. And so if you can reduce, and I would say remove all processed sugar, all processed foods, and <laughs> remove gluten from your diet, at least going up to uh, these situations where you need to feel your best and perform your best and not have to worry about eating every five seconds, at least get rid of those things. Energy strategy part one, we got hydration and electrolytes. So you may have heard the phrase before, you're not hungry, you're dehydrated. A lot of fitness health gurus will talk about like, oh, if you feel hungry, like drink some water and you may realize that you weren't hungry after all. Well, they're right. That is very true. It's actually a good idea to keep up that hydration throughout the day to keep yourself from getting to that point. Now, the problem is if you just drink water like out of the tap, it does not come in the same way that we evolved to drink water. Water needs to have electrolytes in them. And it's just a bunch of minerals, okay? That, that water would naturally come with uh, in the wild but we don't get the water that way anymore. So I add electrolyte drops. You can get a link to the electrolyte drops that I have in the description, or sometimes I just sprinkle salt. I also have some potassium. I'll put a little potassium, a little salt, and make sure that I'm actually getting those minerals. Now, potassium and sodium, incredibly important for almost every single thing that all the cells in your body needs to do to feel good, to make energy, all that stuff. We need those two things. So if you can stay hydrated, if you can keep those electrolytes in you, you're going to stay awake and 
alert and feeling good much longer without eating. Okay, energy strategy part two. So we talked already about the creation of a meal that will give you the most satiety, right? And that was like proteins and fats. Those were like the real winners, right? We wanna like do a lot more of that and a lot less of the little twigs that are just gonna make you hungry again. So I hope you agree with me now. So I'm sure you've heard of the ketogenic diet was originally created to treat people with epilepsy that was not well treated with anything else. And it's turned out that it's actually quite anti-inflammatory and very good for the brain. It helped me after my brain injury. It can help with a lot of anti-inflammation. There's, I mean, there's like so many things that the ketogenic diet can help with. But the reason why it can help with fasting is that the body utilizes glucose. Glucose is a molecule that comes with carbohydrates and sugars, etc. And your body likes to use it for that quick energy, right? But then there's the long energy out of fats, right? So if you lower your carbohydrate intake or if you just stop eating completely, your body's really freaking smart. It's got a backup systems left and right for all sorts of things. And one of its most awesome backup systems is for when you don't eat. And that is that your liver will start utilizing. It's like, oh, I'm not getting a lot of glucose anymore. I'm going to start making some of my own. I'm going to start breaking down some stores that I have of this glucose. But space is limited. I don't have a lot of storage of this. And there are certain tissues that really need it and a lot of tissues that don't need it. So I'm going to start making something else that all the other tissues can use so I can, you know, conserve this glucose, right? And so what it does is it taps your fat stores. It gets some fat from there. It takes that fat. It turns it into another energy product called ketones. And those ketones are then used by your body for energy. And that then you're able to burn a lot of body fat. So people who are on the ketogenic diet, and we talked about this in med school, it, to, to my <laughs> surprise and happiness, uh, my professor talked about people that are able to do a ketogenic diet are actually able to get to the point their body switches over to this very easily and then it's much more comfortable for them. And, and that's why they lose so much body fat. Well, great, you can lose body fat, but it also means that you can go without food far more comfortably and not go through the aches and pains of switching sources from glucose to ketones like other people might have to do that eat a standard diet and then have to go into Ramadan, for example. So that was like a really simplistic way of explaining ketosis. But if you eat a diet normally, more low carbohydrate, and also do some of this intermittent fasting, you are training your body to be able to tap into these stores all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. So that when you eat, sure, that process is going to stop for a little while, but then it will kick back in really easily, really easily. And you will not have those, oh, oh, glucose, oh, fat, oh, glucose, oh, fat, like terrible feelings that you have when you're switching between the two. So that puts you at an advantage over other people. Okay. So that moves me into the Ramadan preparedness theory. So if I were to give the advice to someone, maybe to myself, about how to prepare to do Ramadan, which is every single day during the day, not being able to drink anything, not being able to eat anything, but still be able to, for example, be awesome at med school and not fail. I would tell them they should start on a low carb, higher fat diet, normal protein diet as early as possible. I would say like two, three weeks would be good to let your body really settle into it. And I would suggest maybe starting low carb for the first week. Second week, try to do two meals a day in like an eight hour window. And then the third week, go into one meal a day in like a one to two hour window. And it can be a big meal. And it's not about eating less, it's just eating enough for your day, but in a smaller window, which many, many studies have shown to be far more beneficial for you. And I have other videos on my channel about that. But yeah, so if you set it up two to three weeks from the beginning of Ramadan doing that, then you get to start Ramadan already in fat burning mode, already used to eating one meal a day. And now you just got to deal with the not drinking. And that is the part that I'm trying to figure out. And that is one of the reasons why I am not doing coffee at all this month. So I don't have to worry about that addiction if I decide to do Ramadan. So anyway, I hope this video is helpful in at least giving you a larger framework of thinking about fasting, of thinking about just normal life in general. How can I build my meals to provide me with the greatest satiation, keep me from overeating and keep me satisfied and thinking clearly and sharply whenever I may need to. And maybe it means just being prepared for emergencies, being prepared uh, for things happening at work and you don't have to stop and eat that crappy pizza that your boss bought for everybody because everyone's stuck around a table trying to fix the servers, you know? Like you are not gonna be the weakling. You get to stay focused, you get to solve the problem. So maybe that inspires you a little bit. But if you have any questions, definitely put them down below. I'm looking to do a Q&A soon. And hopefully next week, I will have that satiation hormone video for you. In the meantime, take care and I'll see you next week. Bye.
拜。